Welcome to the beginning of Turning Points in Physics. It's one of the four optional modules in AQA Physics, and it covers loads of the big discoveries and changes in thinking that have happened over the last few hundred years. If you have two plates, and this one is negatively charged, and then we have uh, another plate with a hole in the middle, and uh, that's positively charged, and we have a PD across them, then if electrons leave this negative plate, then they're gonna be accelerated towards this positive plate, and actually they're gonna whip right through there. There was a time when physicists didn't know what electrons were. All they saw was this going on. What they saw is that when you have a cathode here and you charge it negatively, and you have it in a low pressure gas, we don't really see much happening. But when we heat this cathode here, we see a sort of glow going on. And because this glow was happening around the cathode, they decided to call it a cathode ray. Uh, the scientists who were doing this then had an anode and they knew that whatever was being released at this point here was being accelerated towards there going through the anode. Now, why do we have this glow going on here? Well, we know that there's a glow because something is coming off this anode and colliding with the gas molecules in this tube here. So scientists said, okay, we don't really know what these things are yet. We know that this only happens when we heat the cathode. And that's because, as we know now, we're giving the electrons energy. Kind of like the photoelectric effect, where we have an energy of a photon going in, being absorbed by an electron, the electron escapes. Here though, we just have a bunch of heat going in, the electrons getting the energy, and that's how they escape. We call this thermionic emission. So it was at this time then that they said, well, we think that whatever's being released, we think that these are negatively charged particles, but we don't know exactly what they are, what their mass is, what their charge is, or anything like that. So started the endeavor to discover everything that we possibly could about these particles, which we now call electrons. So they said, we're gonna assume that these things that we're gonna call electrons, they have a charge, and we're gonna call this charge E. And we know they have a mass as well. We're going to call that just M naturally. But as you'll find out in a minute, they couldn't find either of these things individually. The only thing they could find out to begin with was the specific charge. And that's equals to E over M. And we're gonna be seeing a lot of that in this video. So just one more thing. If we have these two plates, the cathode and the anode, we have something that's supplying a PD for those two plates. We're going to call this voltage, this PD VA. You might see it as V, but we're gonna call it VA. And we know that this PD is accelerating the electrons from the cathode to the anode. And we know that any PD or any voltage is energy per unit charge. So we can say that VA is gonna be the energy divided by the charge, which is little e. What type of energy are they going to have by the time they reach the anode though? Well, it's gonna be kinetic energy because they're accelerating. So rearranging this, we have EK equals E, V, A. Charge of electron times the accelerating PD. And we know kinetic energy to be equals to half um, V squared, little V squared. Don't get confused between your Vs. So whenever you see an electron being accelerated through PD, you go straight for EV equals half MV squared. Rearranging this to find out the speed of an electron, we end up with V equals the square root of two E V A, that is, over the mass. Can you see that we have a specific charge in there? E divided by M. So here's the problem is that in order to find out specific charge, we need to know the speed. And in order to know the speed, we need to know the specific charge. So we need some way of using this to find out what the specific charge of electrons are. And there are three ways. Well, two and a half. Method number one is firing electrons through parallel plates. Between these plates, we obviously have an electric field. So if we fire electrons from an electron gun through here, then they're going to feel a force that's equals to the electric field strength, that's not energy, times E. By the way, the electric field strength is equals to the PD across the plates divided by D. Now be careful, this PD is not the PD that's used to fire the electrons to begin with. So we are dealing with different PDs here. If that was left to happen, then the electron would go upwards like that. Um, we'll see what happens in a minute when that's allowed to happen. But what we do is have a magnetic field as well. If you have a magnetic field going into the page here, and according to the motor effect, Fleming's left-hand rule, 
the force is going to pull downwards. That force is equals to B E V, the speed of the electron. What we do is tweak the electric field, so we have a force that is balancing the magnetic force, and we end up with E E equals B E V. Rearrange that, the E's cancel, and we end up with a speed that can be calculated by taking the electric field strength, defining it by the magnetic flux density. And here's our electron gun over here. It's got a cathode, it's got that anode again, but we don't really need to draw that. All we need to know is that the electrons that are coming into here have been fired from this electron gun. So as per usual, we have EVA equals half MV squared. Rearrange that for specific charge. We have E over M equals V squared over two VA. Popping this into here gives us E squared over two VA. B squared. So knowing the electric field strength, magnetic flux density, and the accelerating PD that fired the electrons to begin with, we can find out the specific charge this way. By the way, this is also used to select velocities for mass spectrometry as well. The second way is to just have a magnetic field. Here's a small electron gun here, and we're gonna have this in an evacuated tube. The electrons are being fired out this way here, and if you have a magnetic field going in, and you should know from magnetic fields, the electrons are going to take a circular path. And then we measure the radius of that circle. And here's the center of the circle, and you should know that any given time, the force on the electron is pointing towards the center of the circle there. So that's our F again, that's equals to B E V. The force is B E V, but we know that that is acting perpendicularly, centripetal force, so that's also equals to M V squared over R. Cancelling one of the V's and then rearranging to find E over M, we end up with this. By the way, if you're being asked to find specific charge from any of these, it's a good idea to, as soon as you have an equation, to go straight for E over M. So E over M and then we end up with V over B R. But we know from earlier that we can know the speed of the electrons from the electron gun by doing E V A equals half mv squared, and then rearranging to find that speed. That ended up being the square root of two VA times the specific charge. So putting this back into here then, first of all, we can just say that this is the square root of the specific charge times the square root of two VA. Putting that back into here, what we end up with is E over M equals square root of E over M times the square root of two VA over BR. One of these cancels out, and we end up with the square root of E over M equals this. Square everything, and we end up with a specific charge of two VA over B squared R squared. Once again, just knowing the magnetic flux density, the measuring the radius of the circle, and knowing the accelerating PD from the electron gun, we can find out the specific charge. The last way is going back to our parallel plates here, and if we know that they're a length L, and we know that they're separated by D, then what we can do is fire electrons through. So we start off with no electric field strength, and the electrons go straight through. There's no magnetic field in this, by the way, just to be clear. And then what we do is increase the PD across these two plates until we just get these electrons clipping the end of the plate there. And so we do have a current being set up. This is parabolic motion and it's constant acceleration upwards. So that means that we are gonna have to use SUVAT. So this is what's going on vertically. This is what's going on horizontally. Just like projectile motion, we can say that the horizontal speed is just the distance, so that's L over the time. So if the electrons are coming in halfway between these plates, then it's traveling a distance upwards of D over two. Easy. U, as per usual, is zero meters per second because to begin with, it has no vertical velocity. V, well, we don't really care about V. Now, A, from Newton's second law, we know that A is acceleration is force divided by mass. Well, what is the force? Well, we've got an electric field, so it's gonna be E, E over M. We've already found that we've got specific charge involved. And time going from this is going to be the length of the plates divided by the horizontal speed. Now the problem with this is that this speed here 
is equals to, just like earlier, root two VA is a specific charge. So theoretically, we are going to use the equation S equals UT plus half AT squared. UT disappears because U is zero to begin with. Now here's the problem, is that because we've got specific charge in acceleration and time as well, when we put everything into our equation of motion here, what we find is that the specific charges actually cancel out. So that's a little bit redundant. So when you get a question, most likely you'll be given the speed of the electrons without actually having to calculate it from a PD. If you have the speed, you can find out the time and then you can just go ahead and work out what the acceleration is. So rearranging this, we have A equals 2S over T squared. That's going to be equals to 2, lots of D over 2. They cancel, divided by T squared, which is going to be L over the horizontal speed squared. I'm just going to call that V for now. So that gives us D V squared over L squared. And of course, this is equals to the acceleration, which is E, E over M. Finishing this off, take the electric field strength to the other side. We can find out the specific charge by doing the distance between the place times the speed going in squared divided by L squared E. And again, we can say that the electric field strength is just the PDV over D. Final form of this is D squared V squared over V L squared. This PD is not the accelerating PD, it's the PD between the plates here. It's unusual to have a question on this technique of finding the specific charge for precisely the reason that we said, that in order to find out the speed, you need to know the specific charge, so it's a bit redundant. So all of these methods resulted in a specific charge of 1.76 times 10 to the 11 coulombs per kilogram. In other words, if you have a kilogram of these things that they called electrons, then it would altogether have a charge of a massive number of coulombs. The fact that this was so big compared with the specific charge of a hydrogen ion just went to show that electrons must be very, very, very small when compared with protons. So they knew the specific charge of an electron, but in order to find out charge and mass, they needed to find out the other one first. What got cracked? It was the charge first, and that was done by Robert Millikan, and he had an oil drop experiment. It's really important that you know the ins and outs of this experiment very, very well, because it's prime stuff for six mark questions. So what he did was spray a bunch of tiny, tiny oil droplets, and as he fired them in, they went through a mesh which was charged, and it made the oil drops positively charged into a microscope setup so he could see these oil drops moving. What he did was let these oil drops fall at terminal velocity. And he could measure with his microscope how fast they were falling. Now, if they're falling at terminal velocity, then we know that mg, the weight, equals the drag force. Now, drag force for a spherical object is given by Stokes' law. And that is 6 pi r eta v. Radius of the oil drop, speed of the oil drop. This here is what we call dynamic viscosity. And it's just a constant associated with the fluid that the object is flowing through. In this case, it was air. So Millikan, first of all, needed to know the mass of a single droplet. Problem is to find out the mass, which is 4 thirds pi r cubed, that's the volume times the density of the oil, you need to know the radius. So this is mg still, but I've just put mass in terms of density instead, and this is still equals to 6 pi r eta v. Rearranging this, we end up with a radius that is equals to the square root of 9 halves of eta v over rho g. Knowing this then, he could put this back into this equation up here to find out what the mass of an oil droplet is. Once he found out how fast it was going, and so could find out the mass, he then made it levitate using an electric field. So he wanted to calculate the charge on each individual droplet. And they were going to be all sorts of different charges. So the weight is going to be equal to EQ, the charge of the droplet, but E is equal to V over D. Rearranging, he could find out the charge of a droplet by taking the mass, which he got from Stokes law, times G, times D, distance between the place, divided by the potential difference between them. So what did he find? He calculated a bunch of charges 
that were quite big, but let's say the numbers were something like 3.2 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. That was a charge of one. The next oil droplet was 6.4 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. The next one was 11.2 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. What did he figure out? Well, the common factor between all of these charges is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So Millikan deduced, so the smallest little bit of charge that was on his oil droplets had to be this many coulombs. And once you know the charge of an electron, once you've got the charge of an electron, it's easy to find out the mass because we already have the specific charge. So that is discovery of the electron and its charge and mass. Now for turning points as well, you do have the photoelectric effect again and electron diffraction, de Broglie wavelength, etc. again, but all of that stuff I've covered in previous videos. So go and have a look at those again if you need to. So I hope you found this helpful. If you have, then please leave a like. And if you have any questions or comments, leave them below. And I'll see you next time.